Okay, first of all, please welcome Dr. Charman Do. Thank you, sir. And will be translated only in the important part by Pa Man, Dr. Charman and Pa Man, okay. okay. Shall we? Okay. okay. Hi, hi, everybody. Um, I'm so sorry I can't speak in Thai, so I'm gonna have to speak. No need to sorry at all. <laughs> Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak to the students. Uh, so as um, was introduced, I curated an exhibition that was in Singapore. Um, it just closed last month, so it ran for about eight months. And this is this is the show. Um, this was the kind of publicity material. So as they mentioned, it. It took more than five years to research this exhibition, which I know seems very long to very young people, because five years seems like a very long time to all of you, but it's not a very long time to me. Um, and it took so long because uh, it was a very difficult exhibition to put together. So the exhibition is about Southeast Asia, it's about photography in Southeast Asia from invention until today. So that's more than 150 years. And it's very difficult because unlike European or American photography, you can't just look for the information in a book. It's not published. So a lot of the time spent is to go and find the photographers, find the photos. Um, so I, I know you've done a little bit of history of photography. Um, and maybe you already know this, but when you look at textbooks, a lot of times it's going to be European and American photographers, right? You, you seldom find any information about not just Southeast Asia, even African photography um, or Indian photography now, slowly, there's a bit more research, but Southeast Asian photography you can't find. So actually the book that I, I brought, it's sort of a, one of the first books to really be a reference material. So we had to find the photographers. Many of the photographers are dead. So you have to find the families. And you have to find the work. And because we are exhibiting an exhibition, we're not writing a book, we are showing an exhibition, it means that you have to, to find the actual photo. And if the photo doesn't exist, can you make new photos from negatives? So there's all that, and that takes a very long time. Also, um, in Singapore, like I speak English and Chinese, but obviously in Southeast Asia, there are so many languages. So for example, in Thailand, we had to appoint, or we had to find a Thai speaking research assistant to help us um, get the information in, in Thailand, for example, through the Thai archives, the Thai National Archives. In Vietnam, we also had to hire a Vietnamese speaker. So all these things take a lot of time. That's why it took five years, like, yeah. Um, do you need to say anything? I continue. Do I need to translate? <laughs> Don't clear me. Okay? Okay. Okay, good. Okay? Very good. <laughs> Very good. So don't need me at all. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I go? <laughs> so um, before I, so actually during this lecture, I'm going to just introduce the exhibition, but before I talk about the photographs inside the exhibition, I thought maybe I'd tell you a little bit about why it was quite difficult to put this exhibition together. So first of all, like I, I just said, very little information, so we have to find. So it's, it's primary research. So there's a difference between primary and secondary research. Secondary research means you just look in books. Primary research means you have to go and find the actual unpublished material. So we had to do that. But the second thing, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, photography isn't just one kind of photography, right? You study a lot of different photography. So there's art photography, conceptual photography, there's photojournalism, there's commercial studio photography, product photography, fashion photography. So for us, when we decided to make this big exhibition, and there was over 300 um, works in the exhibition. When we do an exhibition like this, what kind of photographs do we want to show? Do we only show art photos? But then art photos is very small, so like it's hard to understand what's happening with photography if you only show art photos. But if you show everything, then it's also too much. So a lot of um, decisions, like very difficult decisions, have to be made about 
what to include in each section. And of course, when it comes to the contemporary section, also, you know, you're dealing with living photographers, so everyone's like alive. And of course, everyone's like, why, why am I not in the show? Why you put this person in the show and this person's not in the show? And I had a lot of these sorts of questions, not just from, lucky I'm in Singapore, so they can't find me, only the people in Singapore can look for me. But um, we had, I, I knew artists in, in Vietnam, um, even in Thailand, who was like, oh, oh, how come you show this person and not this person? So all that also has to be taken into account. And the third thing, which is the most, I think for me, the most important thing, but probably also the most difficult to, to grasp because it's quite theoretical. When we talk about a history of photography, in textbooks, often the history of photography is driven by developments in Europe and America. That's just how it is, okay? And these developments tend to be driven by technology. So often the history will go like, okay, invention of photography, then daguerreotype, then um, wet plate technology, silver gelatin, uh, digital photography. So this is like the history of the technical developments. So that's one way that books will teach you about history of photography. The second way books will, will talk about photography is through style. So for example, it starts with uh, maybe pictorialism, then maybe uh, photography and exploration. Uh, it talks about uh, modernism, and then after modernism, new objectivity, for, uh, documentary. So that, it's that kind of stylistic development. So that's how we explain the story of photography. But when you talk about photography in Southeast Asia, that doesn't work. Like I find it very difficult to show what's happening in this region by using those frameworks. Let's give you a very easy example, pictorialism. So pictorialism was a movement that started in Europe in 1890s. 1890s, right? Long, long, long time ago. In Thailand and in Singapore, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, pictorialism was the most popular in 1950s. So it's 60 years after it happened in London and Europe. So if we follow the, the framework, the stylistic framework that, that um, they teach you know, in terms of European photography, then what happens is Southeast Asia looks like it's very late, like we are 60 years behind what's happening in Europe. And not only do we look late, we look like we are copying. So, so this kind of like inadequacy, you know, where the time doesn't fit, is, it, it creates a lot of problems when you're talking about history. So instead, we didn't, want to, we didn't want to use that kind of history to show this exhibition. So in the end, after thinking for many months, um, we ended up using a very, very simple question. And the question is, what do photographs do? So what do photographs do became the, the question that helped to tell the entire story of the history of photography in Southeast Asia. So what the photographs do means I don't have to think about technology. Like technology is it's, it's there, but it's not the kind of driving force. And I don't have to think about style, modernism, pictorialism, impressionism, all that. I, it's there, but it's not how the story is told. And I hope through the lecture you understand what I mean when I say, what do photographs do becomes the question. So let let's me help Yes. ที่อาจารย์ชัยนายครับพูดเนี่ยก็คือเราบอกว่าภาพถ่ายมันเกิดขึ้นมาเนาะในในยุโรปในอเมริกาเนี่ยมันก็มันก็ <coughs> ประเด็นก็คือเค้าบอกว่าตรงกันข้ามกับในเซาท์อีสต์เอเชียมันหาของพวกนี้ไม่เจอเพราะฉะนั้นหนังสือที่มันสอนประวัติศาสตร์โ
้แล้วก็ยังอยู่ยังไม่ไปไหนยังไม่เคลื่อนตัวไปสู่พื้นที่อื่นเพราะฉะนั้นเขาก็บอกว่ามันเป็นเรื่องที่ท้าชายมากสําหรับเขาที่จะศึกษาประเด็นเนี้ยในเซาท์อีสเอเชียเพราะของพวกนี้มันไม่มีอยู่แค่ไม่มีใครศึกษาไว้เลยไอ้คนที่ทําไว้แล้วก็ตายห่างไปหมดแล้วก็มีอย่างเงี้ยนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นมันเลยเป็นโจทย์ยากของเขาเพราะฉะนั้นเขาเลยตั้งโจทย์ในการศึกษาใหม่ว่าเขาย้อนกลับมาที่คําถามโดยที่ไม่ต้องไปพยายามหาว่าไอ้เทคนิคที่มันเคลื่อนที่ไปมันคืออะไรแนวคิดที่มันพยายามทําอยู่คืออะไรแต่กลับมาที่ภาพถ่ายมันทําอะไรในเซาท์อีสเอเชียทำอะไรในนี้ก็คือไม่ไม่ว่าจะเป็นหน้าที่ของมันเนาะไม่ว่าจะเป็นบริบทของมันที่มันไปไปไปจัดการกับกับสังคมหรือหรือหรือคนดูหรือคนทําก็แล้วแต่อันนั้นคือภาพถ่ายทําอะไรวัดโฟโตกราฟเฟอร์ดูโฟโตกราฟฟี่ดูโฟโตกราฟดูโอเคนะฮะประมาณนี้ครับ Okay, so this is just um, so this was the text that we developed um, to. So this is when you enter the exhibition, you read this uh, in the introduction. So I just put there so that you can see um, how we describe the exhibition. But it's not so important, I think, for for all of you. So this is the five section. So in, with the question, what do photographs do? We came up with these five sections to answer that question. Um, it's chronological, meaning there's a there's kind of it starts from you know uh, 1850s and it ends in contemporary. So there is it follows chronology, but it also is thematic, and each theme talks about like I said like what what is the photograph doing in the 19th century? What is the photograph doing in the 1920s? What's the photograph doing in the post-war 1950s? And what's it doing today? So for the rest of the lecture, I'm just gonna. Briefly talk about each section and show you examples. So this is the first section, colonial archive. Um, I don't know how much all of you have thought about colonialism, but when I proposed this exhibition, I I knew right from the start, even before I came up with the question, what do photographs do? I knew that I wanted a section about colonialism because it is so important in how photography developed. In the region, and in, so maybe I, I talk a bit about colonialism, so you know what I'm what I mean. So when the earliest photos in, I mean Thailand wasn't colonized; it was the only exception. We only thought. <laughs> We only thought. So in the 19th century, a lot of the photos, like maybe 95% of photos made, were made by European photographers for European market. Meaning, all the photos that were made, like tens of thousands of photos of landscapes of people, they were not made for the people who are living here. They were made for Europeans. So the minute you understand that, you will realize that, of course, if your market, if the if the pictures that you're you're selling is for an audience, you make photos that they want to buy, right? If you make photos they don't want to buy, your business will will fail. So. That means that a lot of the photographs made during this time, even if they are really beautiful, like good examples of photography, one must understand that they were often racist and they were often ignorant because these were people who come for one two months, they take photos, and then they move on to a different country. Um, this is just a I, I threw in some. Photos of what the exhibition looked like. So this is the first room. So this whole section is the colonial archive, um, and on the wall, the wall that I I have many many photos hanging. Um, it's it's this kind of photo. So I show you a couple of close-ups. So 19th century photography is kind of a like that's the so my my PhD was on modern photography, but actually my next research is really at 19th century, and I don't know if you've seen these sort of photos before. Have you? No, really. No, no, no one nod or shake their head. Okay, so 19th century photograph. This is made by a German studio based in Singapore, and I want to talk about that photo with the two men. It's a studio photo, right? It's taken inside the studio, but I never call this kind of photos portraits. Okay, they're not portraits because when you do a portrait. You care about the person inside the photo, correct? Like you're trying to tell the viewer who is this person, what have you, the photographer, got to say or to help unveil the person's character or or anything about information about this person. Here, no one cares 
who the two men are because the photographer is selling this 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 photo to people just collecting photographs of Southeast Asia. So I know the words are very small. Maybe you can't see them at the bottom below the men. There's a, the words say there's a number and it says cling washer men. Okay, nobody knows if they are cling. Cling is a race, so it's an Indian race. No one knows if they are really cling or they are really washermen because they are models. The the photographers hire models to put on outfits and to pretend to be different kinds of occupation or different races. So as long as you are brown skin, you can be Malay, you can be Javanese, you, sometimes you can be Indian. Like so, if you see a lot of photos, sometimes you see the same people <laughs> appearing as different. So they are, so, they are paid models. So that's why that in all the books or the records, there's no name of these people. They are anonymous people because they were just paid probably very little money to pretend to be something for the photographs. So in, in kind of scholarship, we call these kind of photographs types, T-Y-P-E-S, because they're not portraits, they're types. They're types of people. So um, it, it, it became Kind of, so you know how now we, I don't know, I don't know, maybe you're too young. You used to collect Pokemon. So it's like collecting. Uh, so you know, like Americans used to collect baseball cards. Last time we collected Pokemon. Uh, the, the European buyers collect these kind of photos and they put it into an album and they collect as many as they can. Um, and, and what is quite interesting about these early photos is always there's always text. So you always see the little text here and the little text here. And the text makes the image mm, like more, more scientific, so you believe it. So because they write the words cling washerman, they go, oh yeah, yeah, okay, this is really cling washerman. So it, the words, um, kind of the, the text and the image work together to, to make you, the viewer, believe what you are seeing in the photograph. Um, so that's one. So that's many, the many, many examples. Um, as you can see, like I, I, I actually in the in the collection we had hundreds of these sorts of photos. I just chose maybe about forty to display. And then the other kind, like this is fruit. <laughs> so even things like fruit was a very popular photograph. So they put like exotic fruits uh, like jackfruit, durian. Uh, coconut, pineapple, and again, it's just because there were curiosities for the buyers to to engage with. So you might think that oh, it's so it's so uninteresting to you, but it was interesting to the buyers in the 19th century. So these were the you know the kind of images that were being bought. And remember, uh, these images didn't stay in Southeast Asia; they all got sent back to Europe. So what that means is, if you were a European who had never been to Southeast Asia, all you know are these sorts of photos, which means that they became very powerful in the way that they, they, they communicated what life was like. So you will never find like dirty streets or, or like poor people. It's always this kind of exotic type photos. Um, and, and maybe, and I'll show you later some beautiful landscapes as well. Okay, let, let me <laughs> translate. ขอขอขอเติมเท่าไหร่นะฮะอย่างที่เราอย่างที่เราเข้าใจเนาะว่าเอ๊ะเราจะเห็นภาพถ่ายภาพนึงได้เนี่ยมันต้องเกิดจาก
นึกออกไหมแต่มันเป็นทําเพื่อให้สายตาคนอื่นดูเป็นเป็นเป็นแว่นอีกแบบหนึ่งที่ที่ไม่ได้ทําไว้เพื่อเราโอเคครับ thank you so this is just another view of the second room um, just so that you can see what the exhibition look like But I wanted to talk. About, so these two photos are on the the back wall, that row. So I'm just showing you two. Um, so these are more photographs dealing with colonialism. These were commissioned by the Dutch government. Pictures of the East Indies. So because the Dutch colonized what we know as Indonesia today. And this is very interesting because there were so many photos made, and a lot of photos. These are like the two. Stereotypes of photographs of the East Indies. One is the train. They love photographs of trains, and the second one is beautiful landscape, m u i i n d i e s And I have to say that it's not just in photography, in in watercolor, in oil painting. These two kinds of photos um, repeat a lot. And these photographs are photographers. It's a kind of uh, almost full tone printing process. Maybe a familiar or not familiar with. But they were made to use in classrooms. So these beautiful photographs were commissioned by the government to use as educational materials inside classes for teachers to teach um, the students about this land that they own uh, in the Far East. And the two kinds of images contradict each other. So let me explain. Whenever they show pictures of these beautiful landscapes. The what they are trying to say to the viewer is how oh look even though we colonized um, I'll, I'll just use the word Indonesia because easier for you to understand we colonized Indonesia but look we didn't spoil the landscape it's still so beautiful because we looked after the land like look look at how beautiful everything is right so I mean that's that's kind of understandable because you want to show that oh you were a good colonial master. But the second photo is the train. So they also love pictures of trains, and the trains are cutting through these landscapes, which is completely contradicting the unspoiled landscape. And the train pictures were used to show: look, we brought modernity to the country. We brought civilization to the country. We built. All these trains connecting the different cities, and ha! Look, we, we've we've helped we've helped Indonesia become uh, a modern 20th century uh, country. So, so nobody questioned it. Like you know, people like oh yeah yeah okay. So on the one hand, we didn't touch the landscape, but on the other hand, we built train tracks through the landscape. And the power of photography is. It could both exist at the same time. People are like, oh, okay. Um, so, so remember what I said, right? These were used in schools. So these were used to teach students about these things um, that might be contradictory, but yet accepted uh, by the audience. And a lot of these kind of 19th century photographs had had this kind of contradictions in them that this whole first section of the show um, was trying to talk about. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so that's first section. I didn't talk about. I mean, obviously, I can't talk about all 300 works. So I just talked about a little bit. But because the first section was called Colonial Archive, I thought it's very important to have section two to show that actually the power did not only reside with the Europeans. Because if a visitor came to the exhibition and only saw section one, then they would think. In the early in early history, the local people completely were just kind of like powerless subjects of the camera, but that's not true, and it's the most clear in portraiture. So this is portraiture, the real portraiture, not you know like the picture of the types of the unknown people, and the the royalty royalty in Southeast Asia very early realized the the power of photo photographic portraits. To present themselves, and not necessarily presenting themselves to their people, but presenting themselves to overseas people. So, so both the previous section, we you know, we're talking about circulation. This section is also about circulation, but different kind of circulation. Um, and a very important part of this section was photographs of the Thai royal family because um, King Mongkut and King Chulalongkorn were both very. Early 
adopters of photography so they actually learned from also oh, this is the section that whole wall is all the Thai royal portraits right so these are just some examples um, King Mongkut would receive photographs from Queen Victoria which is the Queen in England and Queen Wilhelmina which is the Queen in um, the Netherlands so those were the two colonial powers and he was like oh if they you know so they, they use their photos and they send it as gifts to Thai royalty here and he said hey if they can do it I want to do it too so he decided he was going to like ask photographers to take photographs of him and he used these photographs to send overseas also as gifts so photography became a way for him to kind of present himself as equal to the royalty in Europe. And this was, I mean, by that time, King Mongkut was older, but King Choyongkong was young at that time. And when the Thai royal courts uh, really adopted photography, Choyongkong from young, um, he, so he, he had his own equipment. He learned how to take photos. Um, and in his entire life, he took a lot of photos of himself and of uh, the, the places around him, the people around him. So when you look at these sorts of photos, it is completely different, right, from the first section where the guy is just pretending in the studio um, to be something. Here, they are really, I mean, even though the, photography is, the photographers are still mostly European, although this one is by Francis Chit, who is the first Thai um, native-born photographer, but most were still European. Because they were royalty, they directed the photos. So this idea of power, where the photographer is the, the powerful person photographing the subject, is, is changed because they are telling them, no, I want to, you, you photograph me this way. So um, for, for King Mongkut, there's, there's written uh, records which show that, okay, he will stop the photographer halfway, then he'll go and, it's like, I want to change my outfit, then he'll go and change his outfit. And, and he would keep changing the props, like, oh, I want to take a photo with this, my rifle, then he'll take his rifle out and he'll like pose with his rifle. So all these kind of uh, writing show you that they are thinking very carefully about how they wanted to be presented in portraiture. It's not an accident, like none of this are accidental photos, they are art directed, I guess, if you want to use a commercial term, by, um, by the people inside the photo. And that's Chua Long Kong's coronation. So you can see a very kind of royal official court portrait um, in, this, in this work. You want to stop or I go? Yeah, yeah, I have a quick question. Okay. So, so he not literally like realized the power of the photography, but they just want to like uh, present or project that this is Thai loyalty. No, I think he recognized it when he received the photos from Queen Victoria and Queen Wilhelmina, because these photographs will come beautifully. So it's not just a piece of paper like, hey, here, take my photo. It's in like a very nice box with velvet and all. So it looks very grand. Right. And only royalty will kind of like uh -huh. give people in uh -huh. this. So when he received it, he wanted to give back the uh -huh. same thing to uh -huh. Queen Victoria, for example. So, so want to be very equivalent. Equivalent, yes, yeah. correct. So right. if, they, if they take this yeah. important yeah. royal portraits right. to show that they are royalty, then I also want to take the, the same thing. So actually, I think this one, the double portrait of King Mongkut, mm -hmm. I think that was sent to um, the American president. Ah, right. Yeah. So by, by, by uh, Francis? No, that one's not, that one is unknown photographer. Ah, that's one, unknown. Maybe Abbe Ladonni, which is the French uh, monk that trained okay. Francis Chit. But, but this is definitely author. Francis Chit. Okay. Yeah. Ah, the other one is บ้านเราเนี่ยภาพถ่ายเข้ามาค่อนข้างจะเร็วแล้วก็แน่นอนเจ้าไทยผู้แบบเบอร์สกัดเนาะก็รับเอาเทคโนโลยีนี้เข้ามาใช้โดยการเห็นลูกเนาะควีนอลิซาเบธจากประเทศอังกฤษแล้วก็ไอ้ทราบอยากมีมั่งอะไรอย่างเงี้ยปรากฏว่าเขาก็เห็นเนาะภาพอย่างเงี้ยถ้าเกิดเขาทำบ้างเราก็อยากทําก็คือในความในความสนใจก็คือเอ้ยเราก็ต้องมีภาพที่มันแสดงเนาะตัวตนของเราเหมือนเหมือนพยายามจะทัดเทียมอ่ะเนาะราชวงศ์อังกฤษก็พยายามที่จะถ่ายส่งกลับไปแล้วก็ค่อนข้างเนาะที่จะแบบเขาเรียกว่าไงดีปาร์นี่แหละว่าจะถูกถ่ายยังไงปกติช่างภาพมันจะต้องแบบเป็นคนดิเรกแต่นี่ตรงกันข้ามคนที่คิงงงกุฎรัชกาลที่5ใช่ไหมเออใช่ไหมห้าป่ะสี่สามสี่ห้าประมาณนี้เข้ามาตั้งแต่สามแล้วเนาะภาพถ่ายประเด็นนะครับก็คือส่งกลับไปเพราะอยากที่จะดูแบบเสมอเหมือนหรือเทียบเท่าเพราะฉะนั้นเขาเห็น
อำนาจของของภาพถ่ายตั้งแต่แรกแล้วก็ใช้มันมาโดยตลอดเราก็จะเห็นว่าราชวงศ์ไทยใช้ภาพถ่ายเนาะในในการเป็นส่วนหนึ่งของของการปรากฏตัวต่อสาธารณชนตลอดเวลา So this are just two more examples this is King Tre Long Gong um, and it's very different right you see this is like a court royal portrait this one suddenly is like ooh very casual and actually that photograph where you he's sitting on the sofa with the three children that was for a French magazine so it was photographed to be in a French illustrated magazine so you can imagine in his head he knows that this is for a European audience so he wants to so this one is not my my hypothesis a, a scholar suggested Um, which I agree with that he wanted to show like he's a family man to the French audience, so it's quite different from so it's it's a very Western. So he he knows that he's speaking to a Western audience, and even though we didn't Thai culture for the king, he won't be like hanging out with his children kind of on his body like that. So it's very clear that this was uh, a pose also. So he wanted to show this French audience that oh. I'm like a father, um, and you know, it's not just all court royal. I I can relax in a sofa and like interact with my children. And then this one, so Chulong Gong's in the middle, right? So this one was taken in Singapore in the Robert Lamb Studio. So he came to Singapore for a state visit on his way to Europe. Um, and Thai Thai historians say that the visit to Singapore was his practice, like he practiced his state visit, like because he is the first overseas state visit, so he practiced in Singapore, then he went to Europe. So he was uh, on the royal yacht, so he took the royal yacht from Thailand to Singapore and to Europe, and he spent a whole day inside a photo studio. Even I won't have the patience to sit in a studio and take photographs all day, but he and his entourage. So there's different photos. So this is one photo, and you can see again, Chu Long Kong is thinking very carefully. Like he's he seems so smart about how to use photography. So it's it's purposely casual. So you know you see someone sitting on the floor. You see his body is a side profile, not the front profile like a court photograph. Also the outfits like this Western linen um, suit. And the hats, uh, like a mix of you know, like a sailor hat, a bowler hat, and then a military outfit. So, if you, I mean, if any of you end up wanting to study photo history, actually the the Thai royal photos are so interesting. And unfortunately, I can't speak Thai, so it's very my research is very limited. You really need to be able to like look at the language, and also because your Thai national archives is only in Thai, so nobody can Sorry about it. that. <laughs> Unless you can speak Thai, like they didn't translate, um, and it's not online, so you can't Google translate. So, in the exhibition, we actually had quite a lot of these photographs, which um, is not in the Singapore collection. It all belongs to a private collector, um, which who lent it to us. So. It's. I think looking at Thai royal portraits is really like it really builds the argument for how the the local people, the the, the natives in Southeast Asia, were really able to understand the power of photography um, in the early 20th century. Uh, so this is just also oh, so the Thai. Thai royal portrait was here. So across was I showed. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I just showed some um, Chinese studio portraits as well, uh, which I also find very interesting because I think you all like you guys take photos on Instagram and Facebook and everything. But you know they were very creative last time too. You know, like with all the dressing up and the props, and and those two are painted photos. I don't know if you've seen painted photos. So they would. In the past, for portraits, they want the face to look completely realistic, but they like the idea of painting, so they will paint. They'll paint the whole body and only leave the face uh, there, so that it's like a realistic face, but <laughs> painted image. Um, and another very interesting thing about Southeast Asia is monk photography. So this. Is not researched at all in kind of the major photo histories, but this, the the uh, monastery in Luang Prabang um, has a huge photo archive, and they 
a lot of the monks were photographers, which is really interesting. <laughs> and they would all take photos of themselves also in an exchange. And I think the exchange happened not just in Long Prabang, um, but also uh, between Thailand and Cambodia. Um, and a lot of them, you see, they're all colored, like the, they color the robes um, yellow to, to put on the black and white. But due to time, we move on. So this is section three. So remember, section one was colonial archives. Section two was portraits and performance. Now we come to section three, which is mid 20th century, so 1950s. And here we start to talk about documentary because this is like the period where the rise of documentary happens. This is an image of the, the, um, the room as you walk into this section. Um, and, I, and I thought I will just briefly talk about, so this is a Thai photographer, um, Rolong Sawan. I don't know if you know him, he's, he's passed away. And he's much more well known as a writer. He's won national awards for writing, but before he won any awards for writing, he had to make a living. So he actually did uh, editorial photos for a, a Bangkok-based magazine. And this series um, I bought uh, maybe a few years ago, um, which, which Manit had helped me find the work. And it's a series of eight. And I tell you, this is just a story from the installation. When I was hanging this series, right, it, I actually took um, almost 30 minutes to decide how big I wanted the space to be. And this maybe uh, you guys have to hang your own photos next time for shows, right? So this this series by um, Rong Wong Sawan, wait, let me, ah, so that's a picture, is people crossing the bridge. And there's actually, it's a very dynamic uh, series. There's a lot of movement. The angles are really interesting. And I didn't want to hang them too close together because, you know, your eye needs to move from image to image. So if you hang them too close together, your eye will like look at the whole thing in one, one row without a break. But if you have too big a gap, then your eye can't connect to the next image. So I ended up with 10 cm. <laughs> so it's 10 cm in between each image, which was like, so I kept trying different, different lists, which to me uh, kind of was the best distance for you to still get that movement from image to image and capturing kind of that, that visual that um, the photographer was uh, trying to to convey in his photos. So, it's, so whenever you're hanging your photos, you should also think about what impact you want the photo to, to, to reach your, your viewer. Um, so that's the photo. I'm going to, okay, so there were, there were two things that I really wanted to do in this show that was from the start I knew. One was colonialism. The second thing was the Vietnam War. So the, the most important part of section three is the Vietnam War. This is a wall of Vietnam War photos. The five photographs you see here are very famous Western photographer photos. The rest of the wall is North Vietnamese photographers. So this is the Western side. I, I, I hope all of you know the photograph on your left. If you don't have, you can Google. You can show your hand. <laughs> Who know this image? <laughs> no, okay, thank you. <laughs> it's a very famous, it's a very, very famous photograph. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and, and some people credit it for ending the Vietnam War. I mean, but that's a kind of exaggeration. Uh. But it's this girl who's on, like burning from the Nepal um, oil bombs and she's running down the street. So it's this very, like when you, when you think about war photography, even me, right, because I go through the education system like everybody else. When we think about wall photography, often this is the kind of image we think of. Like it's an action image. It's very editorial. It's very striking. It's always of a moment that like, like will catch your attention. And, and even if it's not the Vietnam War, any wall photography, that's, that's what we think about. But this section, I talk about the Vietnam War because, of course, it happened in Southeast Asia. And like the 19th century, many, many European and American photograph photographers came here to take photos. The other one is Don McCullen, which maybe you are less familiar with, but another very famous British photographer. So, wall photography. 
this, I don't think any of you would have seen before. This is, he just passed away last year, 90 something years old. It's a North Vietnamese photographer. And this is also war photography, right? But it's not the kind of war photography that you see in the newspapers um, or Life magazine or, or any of that. And war photography is so interesting because even though we are not in America or Europe, our understanding of how we see photos in newspapers is very informed by like this kind of photography. But here it's so it's not just that the subject is different, it's not just the subject matter is different, there's a very different feeling to this. Um, I'm, I'll go back and, so this is the, what I show you is the image on the far left, okay? Just so you can see it in context. So when I, so when I was giving tours in the exhibition itself, I always stop at this wall and I talk to um, the visitors about it and I, and I always ask them, okay, so why do, you think, why, do you, why do you think this is different? Why is the North Vietnamese photograph so different from the American and European photographs? And the answers are very interesting. And I know you all won't answer, so I won't ask you. <laughs> but the answers... Shall we try? <laughs> you want to try? Oh, sure. Why do you think they are different? Why is it so different? Yeah. เหตุผลทำไมมันถึงแตกต่าง I'm, I'm not quite getting it. <laughs> I'm not quite getting the answer. But, but let, 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 let me try to summarize. She said, it's not to uh, so struggle to find the, the, the scene. Yeah. Something like that. OK. Yes, so, so but that's, that's still kind of the subject, right? Like, it's a different subject. But let me tell you what some of the public told me when I asked them this question. One person say, oh, this is professional photographers and this is amateur photographers, okay? One wrong. This, this North Vietnamese photographer was a photojournalist. He was shooting for the Vietnamese uh, news agency. So it's like actual professional photographer. So it's not, the difference is not because one is professional and one is, is amateur. The other response was, oh, this one um, uh, was made to be in newspaper and then this one was not made to be in the media, like for so much meaning the person thought that, oh, maybe it's just personal photography. I, I'm in the war, I'm a soldier. Then I take some photos, but actually those photos are meant for me to keep at home. Um, but that's also wrong. He, these are meant to be also published. Of course, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese army didn't have access to newspapers and magazines the way that uh, the Americans did, right? So instead, but it was very important for them to show. So when they can, it does get published in newspapers, but when they can't get it published in newspapers, they actually just exhibited them in the forest. So this whole series was exhibited by Vuan Khan in the mangrove swamps. They just, he developed them in the swamp water, like he had makeshift dark room in the swamp. So at night. Hello? Oh, yeah. So he, he, he used like very dirty water. Um, so actually, if you see this in real life, you will see a lot of specks on it. It's very, the images are not great. But the family decided to not clean um, for, the, for today because they wanted to kind of acknowledge that when it was made, it was in those conditions. And so he would develop the film, make the print, and then just hang it up in the mangrove swamps for the people to see. Because just like the other kind of war photography, this sort of war photography was also for an audience. It's not just to be kept away. Um, and I think the other, the other kind of interesting difference is this was the Vietnamese war photos was photos of their daily life. Like they were actually there. Like so even though I this one looks a bit more action, 
um, in this one you can see the photos include people in class, like just children in the classrooms, um, which is this photo. And also just um, the, the dance practice for the, for the performance. It's just soldiers walking, walking in the forest, smiling. Um, and, oh, and there was one, actually one other response from the public. They said this one uh, is not propaganda and this one is propaganda. Okay? okay. Is, you need to explain <laughs> ก็คือเขาก็ถามว่าคนฟีดแบ็กจากคนที่มาชมอ่ะบางคนก็บอกว่าเอ้ยไอ้งานของที่เป็นอ่าช่างภาพเวียดนามเหนือถ่ายเน
who was I don't think in Bangkok, I think outside Bangkok, but the works are kept but in the Bangkok monastery. Not from, not from I, I'm not sure. Oh uh, yeah. But, but, yeah. So he's very interesting. He didn't go to art school. He didn't go to photo school, but he's one of the earliest um, photographs that are very conceptual um, and you can just see even from the image like the way he does all his self portraits um, that he's thinking about very conceptual uh, kind of my Buddha Pico archive collection is in in JS yeah we, we bought the uh, <laughs> series uh, I bought the series okay. yeah so this is just a, a interior view um, but this section starts to talk about the start of conceptual photography um, and we also have uh, Praman uh, Borosvat who is also a Thai photographer who was a Manit's teacher in Silpakon I think um, and what was so this part I it only came up during the research so you know the previous section so much documentary so much photojournalism the photographers are always using their camera to take pictures of events and things outside of their, their selves right but suddenly um, in the 1970s and 60s you see that a lot of the camera is turned back towards themselves towards their own body and what is even more interesting about this is all of them didn't do it purposely together. They all started doing self-portraits by themselves. Like as in, they, I, I didn't talk to you and go, okay, let's all do self-portraits. They just all started taking self-portraits. And, and when I asked them, so some of them are still living. So I say, oh, why, why do you all start taking like self-portraits of 10 years, self-portraits of 15 years? And then the answer is, oh yeah, of course uh, we, are, we are poor students and you know, uh, the, the, the cheapest thing is to take a photo of yourselves. Which is true, but I think that that's not the only answer. I think, okay, yes, you are a poor art student and the cheapest thing to take is yourself. But at the same time, I, I really think it's a reaction to the rise of documentary rise of photojournalism, which they saw in the 50s and the 60s. So by the 70s, there's this desire to use the camera in a very different way, to use the camera for more subjective kind of um, investigation. So for Praman, who you see in the top left, he did an entire series called Autobiographical Images. He used his body's talking about himself and even some someone like Johnny Manahan so that's called self-portrait with lens cap on so basically it's just a black uh, print because he didn't take off his lens cap um, and so you, you can start see, it's very simple and it's very it's kind of like stupid when you think about it but um, it was that moment of conceptual photography where okay actually photography is not just to show events and, peop and, and people like that you see around you. It can be used to communicate ideas. And here, all these different photographers are using it to communicate their ideas. Um, and another part of this section is performance. So this is also the, 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 the time when performance art starts to become um, a lot more popular and a lot more seen and performance art was huge in Southeast Asia like that was the kind of art that actually went international very quickly and of course photography um, was, a, was a huge part of that and someone like Malati so Malati is in the top left she's an Indonesian performance artist so maybe you think oh performance art and photography the, the artist just does the performance art and then the photographer just takes whatever the photographer feels like taking most of the time that's not true so most of the time the performance artist has a very long conversation with the photographer to tell the photographer exactly what they want from the piece so in Malati's case she's very very picky she will insist on every like she will she will imagine every shot beforehand to say that I want this I want this I want this so they have to position themselves correctly during the performance to get um, the correct photo um, and and so it's not ad hoc it's very directed like it's it's like a, the photographer and the artist is working very closely to create these images do you need to say anything or I move on because I get no time. <laughs> ต้องการคำอธิบายไหม
สำหรับพาร์ทนี้นะครับก็เขาก็บอกว่าในส่วนของเซสชันที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยมันเราเริ่มเห็นนะคอนเซปชวลเกิดขึ้นใช่ไหมตัวตัวช่างภาพหลายๆคนเนี่ยเริ่มหันกล้องเนาะจากจากซับเจกอื่นเข้ามาสู่ตัวเองมากขึ้นคําถามหนึ่งที่เขาถามแล้วเขาประทับใจมากคือเขาถามว่าทําไมถึงหันกล้องมาถ่ายเซลฟ์เตตเราก็บอกว่าอ๋อเพราะชนชนหาหาสิ่งที่ถูกกว่านี้ในการถ่ายเพื่อจะสร้างตัวงานเนี่ยไม่ได้อีกแล้วอะไรเงี้ยถัดมาก็เริ่มมาสู่ของของที่เป็นเพอร์ฟอร์แมนซ์ตะกี้คือคือคืออาจารย์ประมวลเนาะซึ่งก็เป็นคุณูปการใหญ่หลวงของของหลักสูตรทั้งหลายที่เป็นถ่ายภาพในประเทศไทยเขียนโดยอาจารย์ประมวลหมดเลยรวมทั้งของเราด้วยนะครับถัดมาเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวพอฟังมันวันโอเคตัวตัวงานพวกนี้ก็จะเป็นกลุ่มของของของ portrait and performance แล้วดีดีพูดอินทิเกตได้เนี่ยตัวตัวศิลปินใช่ไหมนะครับบันทึกภาพในลักษณะของการเป็น performance เนี่ยมันไม่ใช่เรื่องง่ายนะแล้วก็ไม่ใช่สิ่งที่แบบว่าเป็นไงเห็นได้ทั่วไปลักษณะของการที่มันเป็นตัวตัวงานที่จะเริ่มจะทดลองนําเสนออะไรบางอย่างเนี่ยแม้แต่ตัวศิลปินที่เป็นเพอร์ฟอร์มานเองเขาก็ต้องเต้นให้เขาเรียกอะไรได้จังหวะเพื่อที่จะได้ภาพที่ดีที่สุดอะไรออกมาอะไรก็ว่ากันไปนะครับไปโอเค so this is the last section <laughs> yeah last um, this I I don't know you guys know Mitty's work so that's Mitty r a n k r i t y a and that was uh, Thai politics actually you cannot you can't find it on Facebook anymore the Facebook group is is down down yeah yeah but they have the books Ah, uh, okay, okay, yeah. So, so this was the series t a x i n where are you? And and so remember, I said that uh, you know when I'm curating the exhibition, actually the last section was the most difficult to curate because by contemporary, by today, photography is everywhere and it's everything. And so, like, what do you focus on? Because you cannot show everything. You have a space constraint. So in the end, we decided to focus on a few things in the final section. Um, one of them is how photographers use photography to to retell history or to think about new things. So a lot of the the works in this section deal with archive, and a lot of the works are not taken by the photographer. And this is one case. So Mitty did not take this photograph. He just found it on Facebook and he kept it. Um, and published it in uh, the book, but then now in exhibition, sometimes he shows it on a slideshow. So we show the slideshow um, in the exhibition. So we show this one, t a k s i n and we also show Thai beauties, the girls, the very pretty girls who post themselves in the political colors on Instagram. <laughs> That's m i t i s o k So this is the the view. Um, you can see. So, so the final section is also the biggest space. You can see suddenly the ceiling height. It's increased because, of course, contemporary art becomes very big. Um, so a, a lot of artists are using photography as installation now. So we needed the biggest space um, for this show. And I think I will talk. o h this is Manet's work, um, which you should be familiar with. So I, maybe I won't talk about this. Um, but this is just so. So these are all just examples, right? Of works that are in the the last section. So s i m o n g i l Ahmad f o r d Osman, and k e r i Dalena. All you see, they are all photographs not taken by the photographers. All of them are using archival images and manipulating them um, to talk about history. So, in Kiri's work, which is the bottom right, she erased. She she used archival and she erased all the text from the from the placards. s i m r i n g i l on the left, she erased all the text from these magazines, and then Ahmad f o r d Osman inserted. A figure into all these historical. So the the funny color photo, colored image is is an insertion. So, uh, you know, at, in in this period, many people like when we talk about photography, is no longer I have to pick up the camera and take a photo. Now, photography is different. It's it's about it's not just making the photograph. It's a kind of way of seeing and understanding the world. Um, that we try to to show in this final section, um, but I want to talk about this work, Dinh Kieu Le's work. He's a Vietnamese photographer. So that's you know you see the the installation that it's the biggest work in the exhibition. It's seven columns, and each column is photographs that are stitched into these nets. And again, Dinh does not take the photos himself. He went to buy. All these photographs from those antique shops in Vietnam. 
So Dinh Kiu Le is a Vietnamese American artist who had to flee Vietnam as a refugee. So when him and his family left Vietnam, they couldn't take any photos. They left with just some clothes and whatever they could to take and left, right? So he says that he's never had any family photos to look at. So when, as an adult, so now he's in his 50s, um, he's come back to live in Vietnam. And when he was in Vietnam, he found all these old photos in those antique shops. So he bought bags and bags. They, they sell by kilo. <laughs> so he bought like bags. And then he made this work. So we asked him, like, OK, I mean, of course, on the one hand, it's an installation, so you can appreciate it on the formal considerations, blah, 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 blah. But to say, OK, so, but why, why do you want to make this work? Why must it be so big? And he actually said, and I did not believe him at first, he said that, oh, I want to, to find other people's family photos, like other people who also had to leave Vietnam and lost their family photos. I'm going to put them into the artwork, put it into a museum. So this is the, the third time it showed in the United States and it showed in Europe, I think. So it showed a few times in very big museums. I want to let other people find their family photos. Then I was like, what? That's nonsense. Like, who is going to find their family photo? Like, if you, correct, if you go to a museum and you see this work, will you look at the work? There's like thousands of photos. Will you look to see if you can find your family photo? So I, I said, oh, okay, so, you know, artists like to say things to like, 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 like convince people to understand your work. But I was wrong. So a few months after we opened, I, I met um, a Vietnamese researcher. So she was also a Vietnamese refugee who moved to Europe. And I said, oh, how did you find the show? Did you see it? He says, oh, yeah. I went to Dinh's work, and I was looking for my family photos. So I was like, whoa. I, and I think it's because we can't understand what it's like to, to leave a country with nothing and not even one photo. So. I might think it's so weird to think that you are making an artwork to let other people find them because it's impossible but it wasn't impossible it people actually came and and look because there's no other way for them to, to find their family photos and in the united states someone wrote to him to say they found their family right. photo. so there's like so there was a success story of a person actually finding it and, and it's quite amazing that you can make this art project and and that your intention which sounds so incredible found kind of a a, a story yeah like it's, it's don't need to be found but it's like some people to looking for yes, for, for yeah. the refugee because Dinky is also a refugee, right? Yes, yes. He might so right. some some kind of like a community. Oh no, yes. So he said he start because he wanted to find his own. But after ten years of looking through all the shops and buying, he's never found his own. But he says, oh, even though I didn't find my own family photos, I mean I'm a very famous artist. I'm going to do this and let other people see. So. So it's quite a poignant story that I didn't believe yeah. to begin to study, and I'm like, oh, I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and and what kind of take? This is did he write himself? Um, most of them is original. So he didn't write himself. So, is it, is it so in the yeah, in the, when oh. he buys, there's already writing. And then for the ones that have no writing, he asks other refugees to write. So when you read it, so it's in Vietnamese, English, and French, like different languages. And when you read, you can tell which is new, which is old, because the present tense and the past tense, you can yeah, kind of tell. You can understand, right? Let, let me explain some more. พอพอมาถึงในพาร์ทที่เป็นไอคอนเทมพอรารีเนี่ยเราจะเห็นสังเกตเห็นว่าพื้นที่แล้วก็วิธีการนำเสนอมันเปลี่ยนไปเขาบ
ก็ต้องบอกว่าเป็นตัวท็อปของเวียดนามคนหนึ่งที่ต้องลี้ภัยเนาะดิงคิวลี he is doctor as well right I don't know ดิง yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> คิวลีก็เป็นช่างภาพเป็นเป็นศิลปินอย่างนี้ดีกว่าเขาทํางานขึ้นมาชุดนี้นะครับแล้วก็มาอยู่อยู่ในอยู่ในโชว์ของของอาจารย์ชาแมนเนี่ยเขาบอกว่าเขาต้องการที่จะให้คนมาเป็นไงมาดูงานตรงนี้แล้วสามารถที่จะแบบมาค้นหาเนาะเพราะว่าเวียดนามช่วงนี้มันเป็นสงครามอะ่ะมันมันมันแตกกระสานสั้นเซนแล้วบางคนเนี่ยก็สูญเสียครอบครัวต้องลี้ภัยต้องต้องหนีตายนู่นนั่นนี่ต้องมีการสูญเสียเขาก็เลยอยากให้งานชุดนี้กลายมาเป็นจุดหมุดหมายหนึ่งอะไรสักอย่างหนึ่งที่ให้คนเข้ามาดูแล้วเขาบอกว่าเขาต้องการที่เรียกว่าให้คนที่สูญเสียครอบครัวไปได้มาเจอครอบครัวของเขาจะฉันไม่บอกอ๋อฉันไม่ซื้อนึกออกไหมฉันไม่เชื่อปรากฏว่าคิดผิดนะครับประเด็นก็คือมันไม่ได้มีไว้เพื่อให้คนมาพบมาหาเจอแต่มันมีไว้เพื่อให้คนพวกนี้อย่างน้อยๆได้มีความหวังที่จะมาเจอมาเห็นมาหาไม่เจอไม่เป็นไรอย่างน้อยก็มีโอกาสได้มาเพราะเขาไม่มีโอกาสที่จะได้หาอะไรพวกนี้เลยนึกออกไหมเอออะไรอย่างเงี้ยครับแล้วปรากฏว่าก็อาจารย์ชมเมนก็บอกว่าคิดผิดเพราะว่ามีคนที่มาแล้วเจอรูปครอบครัวของเขามีคนที่มาแล้วอย่างน้อยๆก็ได้มาดูได้มาเห็นได้มาได้มาลดความเจ็บปวดในการสูญเสียอะไรในอดีตก็ว่ากันไปอะไรประมาณนี้ครับ okay so this is just a picture of um, the another room and I'm gonna skip this um, and it, this so this is the last work um, it's the last work in the show and it's the last work I'm g o i n g to talk about it's by a Singaporean artist and it's a postcard shop So I decided in the last, the last room and the last work was going to be a postcard shop. So this is h i m a n who's the artist. Um, he, out of about 6,000 photos, he selected 550 photos. Each is 100, so there's a 550 designs, 100 pieces each, and you can buy it for one dollar, for one postcard. So it becomes like like. Like the the museum shop at the end of the exhibition, but I wanted to have this work at the end because she may be showing. So this is the picture. It's like very uninteresting photographs. They're all like this, and I really wanted it to be the last work because I wanted to talk about kind of this the way for photographs today is like you know when every day you take so many photos, how many of these photographs are good, right? You just like you're just wasting space. In your phone, your post, you're po taking pictures of your food. You're taking pictures of of something on the street to tell people I'm waiting here for you. Yeah. So very photographs that are quite useless and photographs that might not actually be very nice either. But the minute, so this one also very interesting because I was wondering how audience will respond to this. So a few people in the museum. So we we had to print all this, right? A few people in the museum said, "Ah, yeah. When the exhibition is over, what are we going to do with all these photographs? We have so many photographs left." They said that no, maybe everybody will buy the photographs. So guess what? People bought the photographs. Like this, these kind of nonsense photographs, people bought them, and it's so interesting because. You will see people walk through the exhibition so quickly. Like you can see, you know, Nick w o d You see very famous photographers, and just like ah, they walk past. So then they come. Again. Yes. So they come to this shop. Then suddenly, I can buy something, and you see they spend so much time looking carefully at 550 photographs because they want to decide. Which photograph they want to buy for one dollar, and chances are when they go home, maybe one week later they throw the photograph away. <laughs> so is this? And I I like this. I like this kind of final work where you are asking yourself, right? How much is this photograph worth? And does putting a value on something then change the relationship that the person has when they come to see the artwork? To the to the image, and it does. The minute you can buy something, the minute you can uh, kind of interact with the work in a different way, your relationship with the work changes completely. Um, and so, some there was a few people who bought all 550. They wanted a complete set, so they paid 550 dollars. This has come a new collection. <laughs> But it's I don't know how much value is it. It's a it's a 
say value. It's it's a uh, attributed value. It's it's gift that value. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like so. Anyway, um, so so because in as so this is instructions. The the artwork is a, a set of instructions from the artist to the museum. So actually, once one design sell out, the museum's not allowed to make new. So there's a pretend mm -hmm. uh, limited edition also that uh, the artist creates. Um, around the world, yeah. So that's the last word. Finish. Interesting. This is 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 the last word. Finish. Interesting. ผมอาจจะเป็นคนแบบไร้สาระก็เลยชอบของไร้สาระอะไรเงี้ยแล้วก็ปรากฏว่ามันก็เหมือนกับเป็นช็อปเป็นแกลเลอรี่เล็กๆที่ขายรูปพวกนี้ด้วยเว้ยในใน,ในตั้งทั้งหมดทุกเนี้ยมีทั้งหมด550รูปจากคอลเลคชันใหญ่ทั้งหมดมีมีเป็นพันเป็นหมื่นเขาเลือกมา550รูปก็คงเลือกแบบจัดเต็มกูยาวแบบดาบดิ้นนะนึกออกไหมเอารูปที่แบบกวนโอ้ยที่สุดอะไรเงี้ยมามามารวมกันเป็นคอลเลคชันนี้แล้วแต่ละแต่ละรูปใน550รูปก็จะมีอยู่100รูปก็แปลว่ามันก็มีลิมิเต็ดในในก้อนของมันแปลว่าคนที่เดินมาทั้งหมดเว้ยนะครับก็จะมาพยายามนึกออกไหมดูอย่างละเอียดเพื่อที่ฉันจะได้เลือกเอารูปที่แบบฉันจะเอากลับไปด้วยมันกลายเป็นว่าคนดูงานละเอียดขึ้นกว่าเดิมเพื่อที่ว่าฉันจะเลือกสักรูป2รูปกลับไปบ้านแล้วก็มีบางคนแม่งซื้อทุกรูปเนื้อออกไหมก็จ่ายไป550เหรียญได้ได้คอลเลคชันกลับบ้านไปอะไรเงี้ยนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นวิธีคิดหรือวิธีการที่มันจะออกแบบในในในในงานทั้งหมดพอจบแล้วเนี้ยก้อนสุดท้ายเนี้ยก็เหมือนแบบทําให้คนได้รู้ว่าภาพที่มันแบบออกมาดัดเดินทั่วไปกับกลายเป็นว่าเป็นของที่แบบถูกถูกรับถูกเอาเอามาใช้ได้ง่ายกว่าอะไรเงี้ยนะครับโอเคอ่ะ that's that's the end I mean so any any question มีคำถามอะไรไหมครับมีไหมมีคำถามไหมจะส่งไมค์ไปให้ถามเองเลยถ้าใครถามแล้วเป็นคำตอบที่พึงพอใจ you need to satisfy the question as well right we have ชะดานเดอะคอมพิเมนทัลลี่กระบอกน้ำเก็บความเย็นยี่ห้อโปรโฟโต้ชาบ้าอันนี้เพอร์สเอตเต็มที่แล้วนะช่วยแบบตื่นเต้นกับของรางวัลกูหน่อยดิอะถามมีคำถามถามอะไรก็ได้แต่ลองถามอยากถามถามดูนะครับครับว่ามาโอเคอยากรู้เหตุผลความต่างในมุมมองของอาจารย์ชนะโอเค He asks you directly why does the uh, the the world photography the the Vietnam one and the the American one yeah What what is the reason that make it different? He want to know. What is the reason they are different? Yeah. So I think it's it's a completely different understanding of what war photography is. So the mm -hmm. American and European ones, they are taking photos for editors, mm -hmm. right? So they are they are selling their photographs. Business. To ed yes, it's a business. So if it's in a in a newspaper or a magazine, mm -hmm. it must attract. Mm -hmm. the, the viewer's attention is mm -hmm. must attract the editor's attention it must work with a headline so you always want the headline photo that they mm -hmm. put on the front page it's like boom mm -hmm. something so of course action is very appealing to mm -hmm. the kind of editorial mm -hmm. um, approach mm -hmm. so but at the end of the day I, I, I think it's very important to understand what we think is editorial or front page it it's affected by how we learn to see photography, right? So from the, from let's say American newspapers, that's how they think a front page mm -hmm. photo should look. Mm -hmm. The Vietnamese photographers, 
different. They're not, they're not there to have like this big flashy headline photo. Mm -hmm. What they need to do is to keep everybody's spirits up during the war because mm -hmm. they are fighting this guerrilla war. Mm -hmm. So it was very important to show the people seeing the photos that life continues. Mm. It's not about the dead soldiers and the bodies and the bombs and all. It's to show, oh, even though we are all fighting this war, mm. but it's, you know, we are all together. We still can live a life and life goes on. So you see very daily life photos, right? Wait, go back. Like, like the woman, so I'm sorry it's so small. Yep. Like this one is two women just walking on the road um, carrying it's water. More, it's more banal. Yes, it's more banal. Um, but again, like banal is like what you think is banal is maybe yeah. not what yeah. I think right. is banal. So it's, so I kind of like, so they are, you know, in the field, they're by the beach and they're all soldiers. They're, they're dressed in the soldier uniform. So as I, it's, it's come from like a different mindset. It's a different mindset of what they, they see the war. Yeah. As for them, war is every day, right? They yeah. are just in the war. Yeah, the the cameraman is yeah. the soldier also. Mm -hmm. But here, the, the press photographer is showing the war to... Like a hunter. I'm like yeah. people, people who are not there, people yeah. who are living, they're yeah. in their living, they're looking at this in their living room in a They try apartment. to do like, their best to present this, this war through his eyes, something like that. Yeah, but so, so it's not that. So even at the end of the American war, mm -hmm. the photographers were also, some of them were also anti-war. They also mm -hmm. wanted the war yeah. to end. Yep. But it's, so you know here it's always like, it's always action, like a bomb or a soldier body or something. But there it's, it's very daily life. So yeah, it's a different, it's different perception. It's like a, to like a, the same story from two perspectives, like yes. letter from Iwo Jima and Frag of yes, Arthur, something yes. like that. Yeah, so two different perspectives, so that's one thing. But the second thing for me is also the feeling, mm. like that one. Yeah. So this one looks very, like I said, like something's happening. Yeah. But this one, the yes. feeling yeah. is very, almost like poetic. It's, yeah, it's more tranquils. It's, yeah, it's like, it's yeah. because like I said, they want to tell the people seeing it that everything's okay. This is my life right now. <laughs> yeah, it's like this is life and we will continue together yeah. um, living this life. Yeah. So it's very different. The answer is that the eyes of the eyes of the eyes of the eyes of the มันแตกต่างจากคนที่มันอยู่อยู่ในพื้นที่ชีวิตนั้นเขาบอกว่าช่างภาพที่เป็นเวียดนามเนาะเขาอยู่ในพื้นที่นั้นเขาใช้ชีวิตท่ามกลางความรุนแรงเลวร้ายเขาไม่เขาไม่จําเป็นเนาะที่จะต้องแบบไปโฟกัสที่สิ่งเหล่านั้นภาพที่มันนําเสนอของเขาเนี่ยคือช่วงเวลาที่มันจะบ่งบอกว่ากับตอนนี้กําลังเกิดอะไรขึ้นแล้วมันช่วยพยุงความรู้สึกของพวกเขาด้วยว่าไอ้บรรยากาศต่างๆคนผู้คนต่างๆเนี่ยมันไม่ได้มีแค่มิติแห่งความเลวร้ายเท่านั้นเพราะเขาไม่ได้จําเป็นเนาะที่จะต้องไปไปสร้างภาพให้คนแบบตื่นตาตื่นใจเพื่อได้ไปขึ้นพาดหัวหนังสือเหมือนกับช่างภาพอเมริกันหรือยุโรปที่เข้ามาถ่ายภาพสงครามเพราะฉะนั้นมันก็คือคือธุรกิจเนาะมันเป็นหน้าที่ของของคนที่ถูกจ้างมาแล้วก็ความเป็นมืออาชีพภาพข่าวมันก็ค้ำขอไว้ว่ากูต้องมีภาพที่เจ๋งตื่นตาตื่นใจให้กับให้กับคนที่เสพข่าวเนื้อออกไหมนะครับแต่ว่าประเด็นก็คืออาจารย์ชมัยก็บอกว่าจริงๆแล้วไอ้ช่างภาพที่เป็นอเมริกันหรือยุโรปเข้าไปถ่ายเนี่ยคนกลุ่มนี้จริงๆเขาก็เป็นคนที่อยากให้สงครามมันจบเขาก็เบื่อเขาก็เซ็งกับความรุนแรงเหมือนกันแต่ถามว่าโดยอาชีพอะเนื้อออกไหมเขาก็พยายามจะสร้างผลงานที่ดีผลงานที่มันน่าตื่นตาตื่นใจตลอดเวลานะครับเพราะฉะนั้นความแตกต่างของมันก็คือเซตของของความคิดกับคุณค่าว่าเราอยากจะถ่ายทอดอะไรให้ให้กับผู้ผู้ผู้ชมเพราะฉะนั้นช่างภาพสายที่เขาทําอาชีพเพื่อที่จะส่งเพสเพื่อตีพิมพ์อิดิเทเรียลนอกงานพิมพ์อะไรพวกนี้มันก็จะออกเป็นเป็นภาพแนวตื่นตาตื่นใจประมาณนั้นแต่กลุ่มคนที่เขาถ่ายเพื่อว่าเอ้กูไม่จําเป็นต้องให้คือไม่มีเพลสให้พิมพ์ด้วยซ้ำเพราะอยู่ท่ามกลางสงครามแต่สิ่งที่เขาบันทึกไว้ก็คือกูอยู่ณตรงนี้เนี่ยหรอไหมเราเราใช้ชีวิตอยู่ท่ามกลางมันอย่างนี้เขาก็เลยถ่าย
ประเด็นหรือหรือภาพประมาณนี้เราจะเห็นว่ามันค่อนข้างที่จะซอฟกว่าเนาะหรือหรือหรือรุนแรงลักษณะที่ไม่ต้องเป็นแอคชั่นเป็นการกระทําเหมือนระเบิดตูมตามอะไรเงี้ยมันไม่จําเป็นแต่ว่าเป็นพิธีกรรมบางอย่างเป็นการประนีประนอมหรือปลอบประโยชน์จิตใจในคนกลุ่มนั้นเพราะฉะนั้นงานก็เลยแตกต่างกันค่อนข้างจะเห็นให้ชัดมันตะกี้ผมคุยกับอาจารย์ชมัยก็คือมันเหมือนกับหนัง2เรื่องอะที่พูดเรื่องเดียวกันอันนึงก็จดหมายจากอีโวจิมาใช่ไหมอีกอันนึงก็แฟกออฟฟาเธอพูดถึงสงครามเดียวกันแต่ต่างต่างจากต่างฝ้ากันอันนึงจะยกย่องให้คุณค่ากับกับชุดหนึ่งชุดความคิดหนึ่งอีกอันนึงก็จะยกยกย่องให้ให้คุณงามความดีกับกับอีกวีรกรรมอีกรูปแบบหนึ่งอะไรประมาณนี้เคลียร์ไหมครับขอบคุณครับกูพยายามมากเลยนะพี่อธิบายให้มึงฟังเนี่ยขอบคุณครับฮิวะฮิฮิฮิอัลโซเฮฟกิฟฟ์โอเฮมอ่าอ่าเวทอนาเดอร์เวชินไอ้ยิ้มไม่ใช่ไหมมีคำถามอื่นอีกไหมครับมีไหมปีหนึ่งอยากถามไหมหิวข้าวยังกินข้าวกินแล้วมีอีกไหมถามไหม No more question. Oh, oh, then of course, then the only person. Ah, come, come. You, you are the one who gave it to him. Oh yeah, thank you. Come, come, come. 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 ก็เห็นได้มีคำถามไหมครับหรือมีอะไรอยากเพิ่มเติมครับ How can you suggest can you suggest a student how to survive as a artist as a student Hard question Okay I can't answer for commercial because I don't work in commercial but if you are conceptual photographer and you want to get exhibited I have I'm sorry to say you have to have an English website, <laughs> and I think that's the big struggle. I think when so I I do a, um so before I was at National Gallery, I curated quite a lot of independent. So I, I curated Singapore Biennale, but I also curated a few shows for Japan. Mm. And the fact is, even if it's a Japanese curator, when they're doing their research. Mm. They, they, they're not going to be able to read Thai. So, yeah. so a lot of times in Southeast Asia, you just have to find a way to translate your website mm -hmm. into English or like no, no choice, unless you only want to exhibit inside Thailand. But, but that's, that's like, if you want, you should, you should be looking, you know, more than, more than Thailand, right? And I think also it's very important that students or, or if you just graduated that you are not shy about approaching curators mm. so i know like when i talk to students in singapore also yeah. they're all so shy they're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so they're all oh, can i do it i do it right but actually how do you how do you expect the gallery or the curator, web gallery can be commercial gallery or art gallery, right? Doesn't matter. How do you think they will find out about you? They are not, not everyone has time to go see all the graduation shows um, or to, yeah, so sometimes I say just send your portfolio, but they're like, no, so shy. I dare not send my portfolio. Even a portfolio review? Yeah, even or you know like festivals, Angkor Photo Fest, Singapore Photo Fest, like a lot of photo festivals have portfolio reviews. That's a great yeah. way to get your work. So even if you are not like, even if you you have criticism from the portfolio, it doesn't matter because it is about getting your name seen yeah. by these people. So they remember. Oh yeah, I know this person. <laughs> this person does. Yeah this work uh -huh. and and sometimes they might not show your work immediately mm -hmm. but at least they know that you exist mm -hmm. and you are your work is on this and in you know sometimes it's two years later three years later like oh yeah i have this show and actually the work is suitable so it's not don't don't think it's it's immediate mm -hmm. sometimes it takes Time. Time to open more doors of yeah, yeah. opportunities. Yeah. yeah, so you must just go. Go go to see shows, go yeah. and talk to people. Mm -hmm. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. 
you get your answer so <laughs> kirim kiti eh no kiti nap eh nap kiti oh okay อาจารย์เลี้ยงถามว่าทําอย่างไรถึงจะเลี้ยงตัวเองได้หรือหรือประสบความสําเร็จเซอร์ไพรส์เอาชีวิตรอดอะในฐานะศิลปินช่างภาพหรือในฐานะช่างภาพก็ตามอาจารย์ชมันตอบว่าฉันไม่ได้ทํางานคอมเมอร์เชียลงั้นฉันตอบในตรงนี้ไม่ได้แต่สามารถตอบได้ในฐานะที่เป็นคิวเวเตอร์ก็คือคนที่จะประสบความสําเร็จก็คือต้องมีงานก่อนแล้วขอโทษทีนะงานนั้นจะต้องถูกแปลเป็นภาษาอังกฤษและต้องถูกพรีเซนต์เป็นภาษากลางของโลกภาษาอังกฤษด้วยเพราะว่ามันแทบจะเป็นไปไม่ได้เลยถ้าเกิดคุณอยากจะเอางานของคุณเนาะไปบนพื้นที่นะครับต่างๆเจ๋งๆวิธีเจ๋งๆในโลกถ้าคุณไม่ไม,ไม่ไม่เปิดเนาะไม่ข้ามกำแพงตัวนี้อันแรกก็คือภาษานะครับเพราะฉะนั้นอย่าหยุดที่จะทำงานแล้วก็อย่าหยุดที่จะเขาเรียกอะไรไม่เปิดประตูไปสู่โอกาสเขาเขายกตัวอย่างงานเด็กสิงคโปร์ก็คือเขาคือสิงคโปร์ยังอายนะแต่อายในอายนี่ก็คือเขายังมาแล้วก็มาโอ้อายแต่แต่อายของเราคืออายอยู่บ้านไม่ไหวไหมอายคนละแบบนะครับความสําคัญทั้งหมดทั้งมวลเมื่อกี้ที่สรุปกันก็คืออย่าปิดประตูของโอกาสนะครับเปิดมันให้เยอะที่สุดเราไม่มีทางรู้หรอกว่าพอร์ตที่เราส่งส่งไปหรือคนที่เราไปคุยในวันเปิดงานหรือการที่จะมาเจออาจารย์ชแมนในวันนี้มันจะนำพาไปสู่โอกาสอื่นๆในอนาคตอีกหรือไม่นะครับแต่นั่งไว้ที่บ้านเฉยๆแล้วแล้วแล้วไม่ทำอะไรเนี่ยอันนี้ปิดโอกาสไร้โอกาสโอกาสรอดไม่มียกเว้นคุณจะบ้านคุณจะมีบ่อน้ำมันใช่ไหมเป็นลูกสุลต่านจบถ้าอย่างนั้นไม่ต้องสีเรียดนะครับเค้มีคำถามเพิ่มเติมอีกไหมครับทุกตามีอะไรไม่มีมาเที่ยวหาเค้ครับ So I call you that day, right? Okay. Okay. ก็ขอบคุณนะครับที่มากันในวันนี้นะครับแล้วก็หวังว่านะครับจะได้ภาพเนาะประวัติศาสตร์ภาพถ่ายในลักษณะของเซาท์อีสเอเชียไม่มากก็น้อยนะครับแต่ยังไงก็ตามเนี่ยนะครับก็ต้องขอบคุณนะครับดรชาแมนต่อโอเคสำหรับบรรยายในวันนี้นะครับตบมือให้อาจารย์หน่อ Thank you, Mr. Kamini, for today. Yeah.